All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Welcome back to Watch This with Rick Ramos. As always, this is your host, Rick Ramos, coming to you live from the Fortress of Ultimate Darkness. We haven't been... Uh, we haven't been recognizing the fortress in quite some time, but uh, here we are. It is uh, Sunday night, August. No, uh, here it is, Sunday night, July thirtieth, two thousand and twenty-three, the year of our Lord. I'm drinking a little bit of Jameson, ginger ale, Canada Dry Ice, because I'm a big girl. I can't do it the way I used to, but uh, I felt that it would it would set the mood a little bit nicely because we're going to go into a uh, we're going to go into a particularly favorite genre of mine. We're going to go into the Western. And the Western has seen a, a number of faces over the years, going from uh, the earliest, uh, uh, the great train robbery, Edward S. Porter's famous um, 1918, 19, I, don't, I don't know when the fuck it was. It was early. It was, it was an early, early short film that Porter did. Um, very... Uh, 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 limited in scope, but at the time, one of the greatest things, you know, still one of the great movies ever created because it set the template. Robbers, trains, uh, cowboys. A lot of the themes that would go into uh, the, the Western as a genre and um, what would maintain the identity of the Western for the next hundred or so years. I mean, it doesn't really, that's the, that, you know, that's one of the great things about uh, storytelling is that the stories, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of different stories. You can't tell a story, um, you can't tell too many different stories. What you end up doing is finding the beauty in your individual storytelling methods. And, this can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing because you see somebody you see somebody like John Ford with uh with stagecoach uh moving on to the searchers moving on to um she wore a yellow ribbon i believe and then um going into the 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 John Wayne mythology ending with Don Siegel's the shootist in the late, the late 1970s but you also see <clears throat> you also see a change in the genre in 68 69 with um Arthur Penn's Bonnie and Clyde which is not don't don't get me wrong which is not um a western but set in Oklahoma and well is it in Oklahoma <sighs> I can't remember exactly where it's at, but I think I think they travel all over. Um, it, it certainly has a feeling of that old. It ha, it, it's strange how it has a bit of an old west vibe, but um, a modern retelling of that. Not not even like a modern retelling, but uh, um, I guess the end of the old west into the new into the new twentieth century. The the bank robberies, the you know getting away on car, the getting away in cars and. The supplanting of of horses and such. It, maybe I'm the only one who thinks that. But my podcast, so I can say whatever the fuck I want. And I can draw whatever conclusions as I sit here drinking. Um. So yeah, you have um, you have the the early, the early Western films of John Ford, um, Howard Hawks. And a number of other directors who would work in the um, in the genre, including Bud Bettiger, um, Delray, da Del Delray Davies, I think his name was, um, um, the guy who did Three Ten to Yuma. I think I, I'm pretty sure that was his name, um, Delray Davies, Delmer Davies, Delmer Davies. Sorry about that. Um, but you see the progression of the Western from those men. Hawks, Bettinger, Daves, um, into, you know, Ford, into the Sam Peckinpah era, which would be 68, 69, with the Wild Bunch, a reflection of uh, the, the Vietnam era, into the, I guess, 
the quintessential westerns, at least as far as I'm concerned, and the the westerns that really stand out for me. And I'm talking about the the Clint Eastwood, the Clint Eastwood genre of western filmmaking. For me, starting with um, the Outlaw Josie Wales, but also going back to Hang 'Em High, um, High Plains Drifter. <coughs> Um, but also his work with the great Italian director Sergio Leone with Fistful of Dollars, Few Dollars More, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And although he was in uh, Leone's final Western, there is a there is still an aura of Clint hanging over it with Henry Ford, Jason Robards, Claudia Cardinale, and the great Charles Bronson in Once Upon a Time in the West, my, for my money maybe the greatest western ever made i mean there's some debate and none of this shit matters except for the person that is making the argument but for my money i would have to go with um once upon a time in the west the point of what i'm trying to get to is um it's a discussion and an understanding of the the evolution of the western and not the evolution as far as getting better, I'm talking about a change in style that reflects either more of the artistic integrity of the times or and, or and uh, a truth behind the world being depicted. I would even go so far as to throw in David Milch's Deadwood from uh, the HBO series that... that it lasted three seasons and was finally gifted to us with a with a final two hour long movie, which I personally loved and um, love going back to. So that being said, I got really excited when I had the opportunity right now playing on um, Showtime, uh, Showtime Anytime, which I have a subscription to. Uh, there are two films that I've been wanting to see for quite some time. And I was excited by one, disappointed by it, and then really thrown back and surprised by the second film. The first film I'm talking about is Walter Hill's 2022 Western starring Christoph Waltz and Willem Dafoe. And this was Dead for a Dollar, which I went into it with a... With with great excitement and anticipation because Christoph Waltz, Willem Dafoe, and Walter Hill together, I thought, would make an amazing film. I, I thought it would be, um, I think it would be monumental on so many levels and I would be blown away by it. And although the film is good, it's well made, it's, um, it's... For video, it shot really well. I'm, pre I'm pretty sure it was shot on digital video, which makes it look almost amateur amateurish in a way. It doesn't. It doesn't feel. Part of my big problem with the film is that it's. It looks a little bit too clean. It doesn't look. It doesn't look dirty enough. And by not shooting on film and shooting on digital video, um, although you can argue that it's the thing that gets the film made because. Walter Hill, despite his successes in the in the 1980s with 48 Hours, Red Heat, uh, Streets of Fire, countless other action films, really that really defined action filmmaking. Not just a decade, but action filmmaking. One of the great action filmmakers of our time. Um, it's surprising to know that he he just can't get a film made today. And part of that is the ageism of being a an 83-year-old filmmaker. Um, it's difficult. He was roughly 81, maybe 82, when he made Dead for a Dollar. And he hadn't made anything. I don't think he had made anything since um, Bullet to the Head. No, he did Bullet to the Head, which was a... Um, he did Bullet to the Head, which was a Sylvester Stallone vehicle about a about a assassin. He did that, and then he would go on to do a film about I don't know what the hell it was. Bullet to the Head was two thousand twelve, and then he did a film with um, 
Michelle Garcia. Michelle Garcia, I think her name is. Um, in 2016, the called the assignment, and um, Michelle Rodriguez. Sorry about that. I I apologize, Michelle Rodriguez. Um, I didn't. I've never seen that film. I haven't had a chance to see it. The film. Uh, there was something about it that didn't really appeal to me, and maybe maybe I'm maybe I'm interested in going back to it and and checking it out. But um, it's it's tough because you you have directors that you admire, and I've I've really. I really love Walter Hill, uh, Extreme Prejudice, 48 Hours, Another 48 Hours, even as, as bad as Another 48 Hours is, it's a fun time at the movies. Um, um, the Long Riders, which is a classic Western, uh, one of the best 1970s Westerns, that, maybe it was 1980, I'm not sure, um, but, but uh, uh, that film, uh, uh, Southern Comfort, exceptional. Crossroads, Johnny Handsome. I mean, this is a director. This is a director who has made a number of films that really resonate with um, men. I guess I, I I hate to I hate to marginalize anybody's um, uh, polit- uh, cinematic taste, but this is definitely a director who makes movies for men. Which is not to say that women can't embrace them and and love what he does, but. My experience has been that um, this is a director that is 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 very in tune with um, male audiences and what motivates them, whether good or bad. Uh, there is a there there is what would be considered toxic masculinity seeping out of just about every film that he has made, but um, done in such a stylish and powerful way. Um, but. Like I, like I, like I alluded to earlier in the podcast, what Walter Hill did was directly, um, he walked through doors and walked down roads paved by the great Sam Peckinpah and, uh, Arthur Penn to a degree with Bonnie, Bonnie, definitely Arthur Penn with Bonnie and Clyde for the level of screen violence, um, Ambig- ambiguous and confusing sexuality and um, in-your-face sexuality as well as the violence and male relationships found in probably his masterpiece you could argue for Ballad of Cable Hogue, Pat Garrett and Billy, Ki- Billy the Kid, Straw Dogs but also the Ballad um, Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia but arguably, a lot of people would would cite the Wild Bunch as the film that really defined um, what, Sam Peckinpah's artistic and in, in artistic integrity, artistic bent. So it was very exciting for me to sit down, and make time for Dead for a Dollar, where a film that I'd been I'd been anticipating and been looking forward to for quite some time. since I heard that he was making this film. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry to say that although it's a, it's a very capable film, it's a very, it's, it's well-directed, it's, it's clean, it's a smooth film, I think that's part of the problem with it, is that it doesn't have, it doesn't have that tension and danger that I know from Walter Hill. Uh, particularly the language. There's um, the story is of a uh, uh, Christoph Waltz playing yet again um, a bounty hunter who must track a um, a black so- a black buffalo soldier into Mexico to what he what he has been told believes and has been told is a man who has kidnapped a white a white man's wife. A white man's white wife, and uh, he chases him into Mexico. As these things, as these things play out, there is always a there is always a, a, a cog. There is always a a, a a chink in the armor, as, as they say, and there is a. Um, 
much the same as in the Lee Marvin, Robert Ryan, Burt Lancaster film, The Professionals, it becomes plainly obvious that the woman is not, has not been kidnapped and is left by her own free will, has left because of a violent, um, at times violent, but also psychologically and emotionally abusive relationship, if you would consider cheating emotionally. Well, yeah, I would. So, um, the woman in the story, the woman in the story struggles to get away from her husband. Rachel Bros Brosnahan, uh, an actor that I had never seen before, Rachel Kidd, she plays uh, the woman who is running, who Christoph Waltz is hunting down. She is left with a Buffalo soldier named Elijah Jones, played by a young actor named Brandon Scott. Um, there are some interesting moments between Christoph Waltz and his guide into Mexico, Sergeant Alonzo Poe, a character uh, played by Warren Burke. Now, these are all actors that I have never seen before. I, I don't, I'm not familiar with them. I don't know them. But I think they're given a they're given a very basic script to work with, and I think part of the problem with the film is that it doesn't take chances. It doesn't it doesn't really it it doesn't have the danger that you would expect from a Walter Hill film. With Walter Hill, you you kind of have an understanding that you're going to see something that is very uh, strongly male driven. And um, difficult. There are going to be issues of race. What was what was so great about Forty Eight Hours was the dynamic between Eddie Murphy's Reggie Hammond and Nick Nolte's Jack Cates, and the struggle that they had to to look at each other with any level of understanding and respect. And in fact. I think that film works. It's one of the few times where there is a level of respect that is that is believably achieved by the end of that movie. This film doesn't even attempt that danger. Which for me makes it problematic because there's not enough excitement to it. There's there's only the danger of this woman being returned to her husband, being found out... Um, the danger of what she might face running off with a black man and that could be that could be something that is a great motivator for a story and yet it's not it's just it's I'm sorry to say that the politics of movie making in 2020 in, in 2020 and beyond has made it so that um, difficult, difficult, difficult subject matter is is handled with kid gloves. So instead of you know in the nineteen seventies, you would have heard you would have heard the um, you would have heard the Poe and. Elijah Jones characters referred to as niggers all the time. And I don't I don't advocate the use of words in that manner. I don't advocate the use of slurs, whether they be racial or um sexual or uh, uh misogynistic slurs. But if you're gonna portray a time, a place, a culture, and a scene I think you ha I think you owe it to the time and the and the power of storytelling to do that as honestly as possible and I find it difficult to imagine that um all parties involved in this especially given Walter Hill's f previous filmography it's hard to imagine that there would be a need to sidestep this For me, it felt obvious that it was a it was a 
it was a political and it was a it was a politically cowardly thing to do on the part of the filmmakers and the studio especially coming after uh, even though it's 10 years and I can't believe it's been 10 years but 10 years since Quentin Tarantino was allowed to do whatever the hell he wanted with Django Unchained. I'm not saying that you have to be gratuitous in that manner, but I do believe that you have to, you have to present the world truthfully. And that world was a misogynistic, racist, and very violent place. A lot of the violence is there. Not much of anything else is. So when you have actors of this caliber, including Christoph Waltz and Willem Dafoe, two of the best character actors working today, when you give them an opportunity to play leads, Waltz playing a lead, Willem Dafoe playing more of a... playing his, his typical supporting role. Because who the fuck is going to give Willem Dafoe a lead? It should happen far more than it does, but I digress. And I know those of you out there who are listening can probably name five or six Willem Dafoe leading roles. So you're going to be like, Jesus Jesus Christ, Ramos. He played Jesus Christ, you fuck. Whatever. Um, we're still talking. I'm talking about the rarity of it. So, um... I can't say that I didn't enjoy the viewing, but it was it was basic at best, and I I I had the feeling throughout that this should be so much better, that this should be so much more. I want to be challenged by great filmmakers, filmmakers that have challenged me before, filmmakers who have shown me that there is there is an honesty in the art and the craft, the craft of filmmaking, the the beauty in the in the art of depicting who we are, whether it's whether it's good or bad, whether it is um, whether it paints a whether it paints an ugly picture or asks difficult questions. This is what I want, and I know I'm in the minority. I know that I'm in the minority in this opinion and have probably been so for the majority of my um, movie watching life. That's the difficulty of that. That's the difficulty of that is that you don't, you don't get to, you don't really get to determine what you're watching or how good it's going to be. It's, it's, it's left up to somebody else and it's difficult because you always get the sense that there could have been more. And Dead for a Dollar, God, there could have been more. There could have been so much more. And I feel as though I was shortchanged. I feel as though I was cheated. And I don't like that. Um, granted, I didn't pay for this movie. I didn't go to a theater. I didn't drop my 12 13 14 15 dollars to, to see this this last Walter Hill film. But nonetheless i've waited for films i've 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 anticipated them i've been blown away by their power both artistically and thematically um narratively and i'm finding that's happening less and less often today so that being said there are times when you're surprised. You you can be very surprised, and where where I'm where I'm saddened and disappointed by this last picture of of a filmmaker that I consider a true hero. The man made hard times for Christ's sake. That's a that's that's one of my top ten. Although you can find yourself disappointed, you can also find yourself blown away by something that you had nothing invested in. And the second film that I saw this w- this week was a was a film 
by a director that I have no background information on, no knowledge of, no nothing previous to compare his work to. And I don't even know if it's a man. The director is named Pazzi Ponceroli. Pazzi Ponceroli. I, I've, I, I'm unfamiliar with this director. I don't know who he is. I don't know where he's from. I'm looking at a picture of him right now, and I'm like, wow, this guy? This is fucking, well, what are you going to do? He's a director and writer. Um, I don't know much about him. I know he's originally from Virginia. That's it. That's all I know. But he directed a film in 2021 called Old Henry, featuring Tim Blake Nelson, who was an actor that I've I've liked in a lot of different things. It's always under the radar. Very difficult to see him. He he pops up here and there, most notably in, um, from a few years back, the Coen Brothers, The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. He was, he was Buster Scruggs. Very funny opening scene. Very funny, dark, weird, strange little um, look at the Western. Um, but he also was with the Coens for Oh Brother, We're Out There. Oh, brother, where art thou? Who he might in the film, he might seem to be the slowest, dim-witted of the three, but he's actually the smartest. He's the actually the one who who has it best together and is aware of the problems that are going on. And I think he's um, he's exceptional in that film. But but here he is given a chance as at a lead, which is as I said, very le- very. It's, it's a very rare thing. It's like Willem Dafoe, Christoph Waltz. It's you don't see it happen too often. And when it does happen, it's much like this with a low budget film <clears throat> that has to be incredibly inventive in its in its action, working from limited budgets, or it has to be incredibly powerful with its storytelling and performances. And Old Henry achieves just that. A powerful, really well-written, really well-acted story that I'm not going to give too much away of. I'm not going to give too much of this away. But as I watched it, I was captivated in a way that I have not been captivated by a uh, performance in in quite some time. Tim Blake Nelson really, he really beat the shit out of my senses as I watched him and... He was he was a bit unrecognizable. He was he was hard to see. He was he was somebody who who was on screen, but that you as a as a movie watcher might find very. I don't know what the word is. The word might be the uh, distant. You, you know, it's hard to imagine. You see these guys. You know they exist. They look. They're they're in the film, it's eighteen ninety seven, I believe, and he plays a he plays a, a farmer. He plays a farmer living in I guess Oklahoma or something. You know, he just he's got a piece of land and he's um it's nineteen oh six. Um He's living in the Oklahoma Territory, scratching out a life um, with his son. His wife has died uh, a decade earlier from tuberculosis, and he's trying to raise his son. And there's a lot of conflict between the son and the father because the father, Tim Blake Nelson, is very strict on his son. He's very, he's very um, closed off to his life. And his son doesn't... His son, Gavin Lewis, Wyatt, the character Wyatt, his son, Gavin Lewis, is uh, unable to to see, I guess, in the sense that we all look at our fathers as just these guys, not, not dangerous in any way. And what Wyatt doesn't understand is that Henry, Tim Blake Nelson's character, 
is moved away from his past. He's 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 left that guy that he once was and no longer wants to be. Which is in itself a standard trope of the Western genre that you've seen in, in countless films where the gunfighter is struggling to get away from who he once was. Um, the example that I'm thinking of, and most of you have already probably gotten there, um, is most obviously Clint Eastwood as Will Money and Unforgiven. I, I watch it and I see that character, but I also see somebody who... Tim Blake Nelson is able to in, imbue this character with a great deal of emotional and psychological struggle. You get the you get the sense that there's a lot going on there, and it's powerful. It's overpowering, actually. You you watch it, and you're on edge because it's weird. I didn't think it was going to turn into what it turned into, and I didn't. I I thought it was going to be. I really did think that it was going to be Straw Dogs, where the farmer is forced to become this killing machine. This, this, you know, that he he awakens in something. He awakens something inside of him that he's been pushing away for for years that has never been there. But the truth, and and this is, and I'm not going to give it away, but um, there is a twist. There is a twist in this film. And I love twists. I don't go into twists and say, oh, I saw that coming, or or I don't try to figure out what a twist is, or I don't... I, I, I love the magic of just allowing a film to wash over me and reveal itself as the story sees fit. As long... As, the, as long as the story doesn't cheat itself by by doing something that makes me makes me recognize that it's too unbelievable that it's too ah uh, it's too ridiculous it's definitely not what this film does this film sticks its landing it really does it really does create a character that when the reveal is given to us you you really understand what has come before you really understand that what has come before has led up to this. And this is one of those times that it, it really hasn't been hinted at. But some of the clues are there. I I don't know. I was watching it. I was taking care of the puppy. Um, I can't even... This fucking dog is killing me. I can't, I can't even watch a fucking movie straight through anymore, which you know pisses me off because I got to take this little piss machine outside to piss and shit every 40 minutes. And the sad thing is I love this dog and I don't, I don't mind doing it. I love doing it. I, you know, the last woman I was with, she needed to stop every 45 minutes to take a smoke and that pissed me off to no fucking end. And I was glad we broke up afterwards. So I don't know. But, um, the rhythm, the rhythm of the film, I'm not talking about the film that I was watching, I'm talking about the way I was watching, and this, this is very important, as you watch a movie, it's, it's important to dedicate yourself to the, to the viewing, so this is one that I'm definitely going to go back to, I just wanted to record about it to get my thoughts down and and if any of you have the opportunity or have passed through this and seen it and thought well maybe I should watch that and they're like ah there's nobody in it that is really um appealing to me I'm, I would say if you're a fan of the western you really should you really should pick this one up you really should give it a chance it's an hour and it's an hour and it's a little over an hour and a half maybe an hour and Maybe two hundred, an hour, and forty minutes, something like that. Um, but it delivers the goods. It really, it. Tim Blake Nelson really does give a performance that I don't think you were prepared for. You, you know he's a good actor, but there's a there's a loopy kind of half wit skill that he brings to it 
that you're willing to be dismissive of the, of whatever danger is there because you know who the fuck is Tim Blake Nelson and when the truth comes out and he rises to that occasion and you find out who he is you find out who this man really is you're completely on board with it, or at least I was. I can't, I can't tell you what you're going to think. I can't tell you what, what you're going to walk away from it with. But as I was watching it, I remember thinking, my God, that's believable. That's on point. I, I buy into this shit. There's nothing here that is causing me to... There is nothing here that is causing me to not believe that what I'm seeing is reasonable. Um, the story goes like this. He's a dirt farmer. Or, or, I don't know whatever. That's what I know. I haven't been paying too much attention to country music. But um, he's a farmer. Oklahoma Territory. It's 1906 or so. He's a, he's like a 50 year old man. He's got a son. The wife has died from tuberculosis 10 years ago. The son is resentful and angry at his father because his father will not allow him to touch guns. He won't show him how to use his shotgun or rifle. And the son feels that, um, this is, this is handicapping, handicapping him as a man. The man that he wants to grow up to be. Um, nobody in the territory is as is as restricted as he is. They've all learned to use guns. Why is it that Henry, his father, Henry McCarty, refuses to allow his son to to pick up a gun? And it could be any number of reasons. You start to slowly get the impression that there is that he has. He has experience, but you don't know what that experience is. You don't know how violent. You don't know if he's will money. You don't know if he's if he's looking at demons and he's seeing things about his life that he wishes he could do over again. You don't you don't know what the fuck that is. And I think that's um, I think there's something about Tim Blake Nelson that is very calming and safe that makes it possible for you to believe that. I I, I don't know if he goes out of his way to. To create that that comfort, or if it's just something that he's naturally imbued with, but I got the sense that he was somebody that I didn't I didn't need to be afraid of. That what he was was a man, not a not a weak man. Don't get me wrong, not a not a pushover, a man who would stand up, a man who would fight if the fight was brought to him. But what he is honestly revealed to be, for me at least, was um, it was heart pounding. I loved it. I immediately had the sense that I was watching something that um, that I was completely thrown thrown for a loop. The National Board of Review. Selected this from the annual top ten independent films of the year. So, <clears throat> not that, a, not that, not that the opinions of a bunch of critics mean anything, but that is something that tells you that there is a <clears throat> there is a recognition for what this actor, this director, these writers, the the supporting cast have created, and it's all there on the screen. It really is. It, it's just, you know, I've seen a lot of big budget, like the last big budget Western I saw, The Magnificent Seven. I enjoyed a great deal of it, but Fuqua, Fuqua went sideways with it and made it a revenge story when the original film, he made it a revenge story which robbed it of its, of its, um, of its purpose. Replacing it with something that wasn't as powerful. And that's a very dangerous thing that when you're when you're remaking a beloved a beloved product, whether it be the Mag John Sturgis's American uh, John Sturgis's American remake of Kurosawa's Japanese Samurai Seven Samurai, um, 
when you remove the nobility of their cause and turn it into a, a, a revenge story, it becomes, it becomes a different film. This film, it sticks the landing because it sets up exactly what it's supposed to be. It's a story about a man doing everything that he can to protect his own. And as difficult as that may be, it is what, it is what someone of that time living where he was living would face up to. Um, in the story, Henry is living with his son. Uh, I don't know. 15, 20, 30 miles away from any other people. You know, typical of, of these type of films. A blood splattered horse wanders in into his home or you know, the on, onto his land. The son gets excited because he's looking for adventure, he's looking for purpose. He's tired of his father's restraints, constraints, um, and he wants to search this out. Henry understands that there's a problem. Henry, Henry understands immediately that there's danger. Blood splattered horse means that somebody is out there either dead or dying. And there are killers out there who have either killed or are looking to continue doing a job that has not been finished. He forces his son to stay and goes out searching, tracking, and he finds the wounded man. He finds him and he finds money. And there's a it's a there's a there's a moment. There is a there is a no country for old men moment where he realizes, he sits there, he recognizes and he says, Nope. And then he realizes, well, if I'm going to take this man, I need to take the money as well. Control this situation because somebody's coming. That's one of the great things about both No Country for Old Men and this is that it's built around the idea that if somebody escapes with money, somebody's going to be looking for that money. And that is a brilliant MacGuffin. That is a brilliant idea of setting up the danger inherent, the danger that exists around every corner in every shadow that exists in the dark. And when you're 20, 30 miles away from your nearest neighbor, there is the fear of what, what this will evolve into. McCarty, Henry, brings the man home, administers medical treatment, and then there are moments where the man comes true. And now there's a struggle between the two of them. What is going on? What is happening? How much danger are both Henry and his son in? Who is this man? And you start to wonder, what is, what is going on here? You have an idea that no matter what it is, it's going to turn out badly and this person is lying. I mean, you don't just find yourself out there in the desert or in the country just, you know, shot up with a bag full of money. You, it, it's, you know, there's a danger there and that person is not to be trusted. So there's this relation that exists between, between Henry Curry, his prisoner, and Wyatt, the son who wants to, who wants to take advantage of this moment of, of adventure, of excitement, and it becomes a difficult, difficult situation for everybody involved. Stephen Dorff, who is an actor that a lot of people dismissed early on in his career, but as he's aged and he's taken on these antagonistic villain roles, he's really come into his own and he started to present something that people are really intimidated and frightened by. And he plays the leader of the gang who comes to find this character. 
he claims that he's a sheriff. But the man that Tim Blake Nelson is administering to also claims he is a sheriff. Who is to believe when you don't want to believe anybody? When there is, who, is, who are you supposed to believe when there's danger in believing anybody? Now, this is very typical of this type of film, but it builds there. It it continues to it continues to 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 stretch the constraints of these tropes. I've always said that it's not so much the cliche that you're working with is how well you play that cliche, how well you play that note, how well you play, because a lot of times these. A lot of times these storylines play out because this is exactly what people do. On a side note, I was watching HBO's The Deuce today, which uh, I really don't like watching episodic TV for the simple fact that I hate finding myself beholden to to yet another um, series. It's a commitment. Better Call Saul, I was I was sitting here for six, seven years watching this shit. I loved it, but, you know, it, it's hard. Waiting. Fucking waiting. Breaking Bad was the same thing. Um, the, the, there was a, there was a, there was a storytelling trope that I saw in The Deuce that made me laugh as a, as, as some of you who have seen it know, it's a it's an HBO show about the early sex, the sex trade, the nineteen seventies New York sex trade, going from hookers hookers and pimps on the street, the cops that bust them and and cooperate with them in some respects, um, James Franco's bartender hustler um, character that that administers to all of it. Um, and the slow evolution of the pornography industry. And there's a scene where a cop, a young woman who's a, a young reporter, wants to begin interviewing hookers, streetwalkers, and their pimps. Streetwalkers first, and then the pimps. And she's crying about how nobody, no, none of these pimps will talk to her. And the cop, Eric, Gill- Eric Gill- Gilliland, I think his name is, Good actor, really good actor. He was on the, the wire, and um, he's back in another David Simon project, uh, The Deuce. He says, "Give it some time. There's nothing that a pimp loves more than to hear his own voice." Now that is a standard storytelling trope, but it's probably true. A lot of times, people like to hear themselves. That that's the point. I I love it that. You can lean into these obvious tropes of storytelling. It's not so much, oh, I've seen this. It's, oh, this is a new version of that. Look at how they did it. That's exciting. That's really artistically rewarding. When I can see that, when I can see the power of it, when I see that it is both honest and... um when I can see that it's both honest and intricate to the story. Sometimes a story, sometimes storytelling is just bad. Like, oh, we're going to clean this up and we're just going to, we're going to have this come in, we're going to have a character come in and explain everything. But if you have a good enough character, for example, um, Donald Sutherland is as General X in JFK. This motherfucker just comes out of nowhere. <laughs> And sits with Kevin Costner explaining the entire Kennedy assassination and what happened in 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 Dallas that day, but because it's Donald Sutherland and he's so good, you ignore the fact that it's it's a type of storytelling that gets you out of whatever whatever corner you've painted yourself into. And if it's written well, the lines are captivating and you have an actor, 
of a certain caliber, then I don't give a fuck how obvious it is. I'm sitting there and I'm eating my popcorn and I'm completely sold out to it. Now, like I said, I don't know. I don't know if the big reveal is such a big reveal. I don't know if I was missing something. I don't know if I should have seen it coming. But I'm glad I didn't. I'm glad it did surprise me because I like that moment where you're, th- where you're, where you're knocked on your ass. When something happens that you didn't expect to happen. I don't care if every other cocksucker in that fucking theater saw it coming from the beginning. Or say they saw it coming from the beginning. I don't give a fuck. I care about my own enjoyment. And even if it is something that I saw coming. If it's done well. Oh my god. Even better. Even better because then there's skill there. There's a power in that type of storytelling. Anyway, as you could possibly, as, as you can probably imagine, things go sideways. The gang comes back. Is this Curry character? Is this character that Old Henry has bothered to help? Is he worth the danger that he's putting his son and himself and his farm into? Well, we all do stupid shit. We do stupid shit for our own personal reasons. Some of those reasons are stupid. But I don't think you can watch this film, or I don't think you should watch this film and be dismissive of the choice made because I can see this character making the choice. But I can also see it playing out in a multitude of different ways. So, that being said... I think it's a great little film. I think it's one of the best films of 2021. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, maybe maybe even earlier than that, maybe even closer to, to what I'm saying. Somebody asked me, no, this is months ago, somebody asked me what were my favorite movies, what were my top ten lists of that, this or that. And the truth is I don't have, I haven't written a number of top ten lists in the last five, four or five years because the majority of films that I've seen have not been in a theater. We were shut down for so long and I didn't get a chance to go but I wasn't seeing I wasn't seeing mainstream films in a theater. I wasn't seeing foreign. I wasn't seeing independent. What I was seeing was I was I was catching on streaming, and a lot of that was Netflix, Amazon Prime, um, Hulu, Disney, whatever. Um, the industry changes. The industry changes. And I'm doing the best that I can to maintain whatever whatever I bring to it. So if you're listening to this, I, I just want to say thank you very much for continuing to support us, continuing to show love. Um, last week I said thank you to Jorge Sacedo for buying coffees at um, buymeacoffee.com. <sighs> buymeacoffee.com slash watch Rick Ramos. Jorge bought a couple of Jorge Sacedo bought a couple of coffees. Someone bought a couple of coffees, and this someone I got to say is a this you know I, we're thankful for anybody who is willing to do anything for us. But someone has done so much, and we want to give a special thank to this gentleman or this woman, this woman or this gentleman. I don't know which one to assume. Um, but you have really, you have really contributed above and beyond anything that we could have expected. If you're contributing more, God bless you. If you're not, well, thank you for what you have given. We know it means a lot. It is a beautiful thing. Finally, we want to say thank you to a longtime listener of the podcast, somebody who was listening way back when I was doing this thing, and Lee was and Lee the Lee the Flying Jew wasn't even watching the fucking movies back when Uncle Joey and I were doing uh, Popcorn Mafia with Gray Drake, and we were doing uh, uh, Beauty and the Beast with Felicia, um, Mr. Cornelius Burroughs out of Alabama. Thank you, brother. Uh, you, you were a godsend. I appreciate everything that you do. I hope you're well. I'm, I'm, 
I love the I love the communication between us back and forth on um Facebook Messenger and I'm sorry that I don't attend to it as as often as I should but uh I'm trying so to to Mr. Cornelius Burroughs thank you to Jorge Salcedo thank you and to someone motherfucker you know who you are you could make this easier on us but <laughs> It ain't about making shit easy for us. We thank you, too. For those of you um, that would like to contribute to what we do, we don't ask a lot. And we're not, we're not saying that you have to. We don't, we don't sell this show. All we want to do is put this labor of love out there and let people know that if they can, if they can find it in the depth of their heart, and I know these are hard times. I know this is not an easy time. But if we bring you a little bit of enjoyment, if we make your day in the cubicle or at, you know, the job or whatever other bullshit that you have to do in order to get you to where you need to be, if you want to contribute to us, please, you can go to buy, B-U-Y, me, a coffee, dot com slash watch rick ramos buy me a coffee.com slash watch rick ramos that's us that's who we are and we thank you so to wrap it up one of the great filmmakers of all time or at least one of the great action filmmakers of all time Ooh, that's my mama calling me <laughs> i'm sorry about that <laughs> i have my phone off I had my phone on airplane, but that shit can still come through on the computer. So for those of you who have complained about the clicking on the texts, I apologize. So, you know, I told mama to wait. Big Mayor's going to have to wait for her big boy to uh, call her back and tell her how her grandson, Jerry Lee, the killer, her bull terrier grandson is doing. Anyway, um, we want to say thank you very much. Uh, oh, oh, okay. So. Walter Hill, um, go back into the filmography. If you've ever forgotten, if, if you haven't watched this guy, go back, see 48 Hours. See another 48 Hours just for shits and giggles. Watch The Long Riders. Watch um, Johnny Handsome. Um, Southern Comfort's a good time. But if you, if you can find it, the James Coburn, Struther Martin, Jill Ireland, Charles Bronson, Charlie Bronson, Sands Mustache, classic, Hard Times, his directorial debut. One of the great, one of, on my top ten, one of the great films that, I've, that I know. Um, not a great film, but at least one of my great films. Um, I'm sorry that Walter Hill, I'm sorry that Dead for a Dollar wasn't more exciting, but it was solid. It was solid filmmaking. I just wish it would have been better. So here's the order. Watch Walter Hill's Dead for a Dollar if you got the time. And then sit back and experience something really great. Um, Patsy Ponceroli's Old Henry from 2021. This is a gem. This is one of those films where it's just like... And, and remember, this falls into the Rick Ramos wheelhouse. Old Men, Redemption, you know... Uh, remembering the past, reflecting, and trying to trying to make sense of it all. You guys are wonderful. Thank you very much. We continue to to dedicate we continue to dedicate ourselves to this podcast because it's what makes sense to us. Now, if you're still listening, if you're if you're still here with us, you like what we do. Please, we get a chance. Buy me a <laughs> buy me a coffee.com slash watch Rick Ramos. Um, this has been a fun episode. I hope I didn't ramble too too unintelligently. You gotta remember, I depend on that cocksucker Mr. Chavez to go back and forth, to reel me in, to pull me back, and to make sense of all of this. And it's difficult when I'm by myself, but 
I still love the By Myself. I still love the AM radio into the night. And I hope you took something from this. Thank you very much. Have a great week. We will see you again next week. Bye-bye.